is symbolic violence, Gary. This is. <laughs> well, this is it's, meant to be it's a text. This is a text that this is a text that the students would be obliged to read uh, later on in the semester anyway. So I thought by introducing it now and then having instead of sort of uh, me forcing it, a discussion in the class on a Wednesdays. If they could come along today and just hear other people discussing it, I think it might be very useful for them. So I'm hoping they enjoy it. Yeah, great. In that case, uh, you might start us off then by introducing the text and maybe explaining a little bit why uh, you're forcing your students to read this text. <laughs> Colin Rowe, I suppose I should talk a little bit about him or a little say something about him. He was um, he was born in England and uh, in 1920, I think. And uh, he was one of these um, mid 20th, mid to late 20th century generation of architecture critics who sort of came in on the tide of modernism and sort of cruised, they rode the wave. And uh, people like himself, maybe Charles Jenks, um, who else? Uh, Rainer Bannon, definitely, uh, Lewis Mumford. They, for a period of time, it seems to me, anyway, looking back, that. Um, it seems as if they were almost as big as the architects that they were writing about. They were giants of, of the profession. Uh, in a way that I don't think we sort of have cultural, or at least architectural commentators now. Uh, Ro, and I heard Hugh refer to him last week as Rao. And Hugh, am I, am I pronouncing his name wrong? Is his no. name Colin Rao? No, it is no. Colin okay. Rao. It's not don't Colin Rao. Me. It's don't you mind. can have a row with him, but he's dead. <laughs> but uh, it's Colin Rowe. You're Colin absolutely Rowe. right, Gary. It's Colin Rowe. Yeah. Well, he compared to some of the other met, um, names I've mentioned, I'd say, I think it's fair to say that he wasn't quite as prolific um, compared to somebody like, say, Mumford. And I think also I find myself a little drawn to him because uh, in comparison to the others, he doesn't necessarily in his writings provide a giant worldview, an overview of how, of how the world can be saved or changed through architecture. He tends to pick a point and develop it. His modus operandi, I think is also fair to say, uh, is a little bit kind of like the feeling of watching that movie, The Sixth Sense, Jamalian's movie, where you, know, you read a text and then you discover, he comes along and he says, you know, you've been looking at the wrong film all along. And I do find that he has, I mean, that might be an exaggeration, but he tends to do that in all of the pieces that uh, I've come across. Um, I, I don't, I'm not going to in any way attempt uh, a synopsis of, of what phenomenal and literal transparency is, but uh, I might just say this. I think that maybe for students who are struggling coming to terms with what it is he's saying, and I hope I'm not doing uh, him any disservice. I think it is fair to say that in what he refers to as literal transparency, there's something that is analogous to say, analogous to how maybe space is portrayed in something like a, a painting by Raphael, where we literally see space in perspective and how things are in that space as they might appear, as they might appear in reality. And I think that in, a, in what he refers to as phenomenally transparent space, I think it might be somewhat analogous to saying it's a little bit like looking at an axonometric or an isonometric drawing, where the respective distances of those elements which enclose the space, they're somehow, that, that's somehow not, not consequential. Uh, yeah, um, that's, that's all I'll say. Uh, I, I personally, I, I am very drawn to his work. Uh, he has a piece, um, Collage City, which I found uh, very influential and sort of provoked me into making an application a while back to do a PhD um, about the use of um, video in, in making architectural space and how it can be used actually as a tool in a way that I don't think it's been attempted before. And I'm still very interested in that. Uh, but I, I do have differences with him and uh, uh, or maybe I do, I sort of, I'm inclined to nitpick maybe on his, on his technique or on, on points of consistency, but I'll leave them be in case we just run out of uh, things to say. So I'm just really looking forward to, uh, I, I, I hope people enjoy the piece. I hope they didn't think it was a waste of their time. And I'm looking forward to what, uh, to hearing other, what other people have to say. Mm.
I don't know, um, Mark, would you like to offer some input on, on to what you, would you? Um, well, oh. yeah, so maybe I'll just, just a little on the essay itself seems to attempt to apply the principles of what he calls analytical cubism to architecture. And he makes a big comparison between the, broadly speaking, between Bauhaus architects and painters, associated painters, and what he calls Parisian cubists. And the, dist the difference seems to do, it's this idea of deep space and shallow space, the space of the, the, the illusory space of perspective and the, the flat space of the painting. Um, very, I think the most interesting point of the essay is the piece on Leger's Three Faces. I don't know if people have read this. He really, when you look at it, you can see what he means, that there's a panel in the middle and it's really hard. You keep flipping back and forth between the suggestion of depth and the consciousness of the picture plane. Mm -hmm. So then he tries to apply this to the villa at Garsh and, and noticeably just to the rear elevation. He doesn't, doesn't seem to treat the front elevation at all. Um, and that's, it's, and then he does an interesting thing about the League of Nations building, which seems to me a very Baroque kind of analysis. Um, but the thing about Garsh seems to come from Wittgauer. He was, that was his big, his, um, the, the, the historian who influenced him at the beginning in his famous mathematics of the idea of Villa, which is how Colin Rowe became famous in the late forties. Mm -hmm. in comparing the geometrical structure of Palladian houses with, with Corbusier. And this seems to take that further into mannerism. This is, by the way, now, I'm now in the bit that I was reading this morning to try and impress you all, just in case you're wondering. The, uh, the articles by Vidkar on mannerism and particularly on the Laurentian Library, the vestibule of the Laurentian Library by Michelangelo, and how there's a continual ambiguity to do with planes a, a, com a confusion between figure and ground would be one way to put it. And this is very much, it's a fascinating account of Karsh. I don't know what other people felt. Mm. I, when I was reading it, to be honest, like I, I, won't lie, I, I didn't think it was a waste of time, but I, I did feel like it, it revealed something perhaps more interesting about how architects use language than, than perhaps the subject matter he was trying to to write about like I, I think this this whole idea of literal transparency versus phenomenal transparency I think the, the arguments that he was making about phenomenal transparency sort of I don't know it, it seemed like there might perhaps even be a better word for what he was describing I know like he, he opens the, the the piece with um this paragraph let me find it here transparency space time simultaneity interpretation superimposition and ambivalence so he's just listing different words and then he says in the literature of contemporary architecture these words and others like them are often used as synonyms and i think um i think the 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 point that he's making the fact that or the thing that he says here the fact that they're used as synonyms i think it's almost throwing away the nuances that each of these individual words have. And then he goes on to try and say, trying to define a new term, this, this phenomenal transparency. And it seems to me almost a little bit pointless. I don't, I don't know if anybody would like to comment on that. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if it's pointless or, um, or poignant or it's, uh, I think um, when, when, I, when, you send me, when you send me an email, I thought, what? I haven't read this text since 1978 <laughs> when I first read it uh, when I was in school. And I thought, uh, it's interesting. What is, uh, what is, how would I actually situate it into, um, into a contemporary context? So, of course, I had to go back and reread re it. And uh, <clears throat> So I read it in three ways. I read it from the horse's mouth, uh, from Colin Rowe himself. Uh, and therefore in his, in my old book, which is all pages are yellow now, uh, the mathematics of the ideal villa uh, and the other essays. And it's an essay, which is sort of at the end of the book. Um, <clears throat> then I read also the link that you had sent out, which is basically sort of um, the same same thing, except that it's um, it doesn't really 
situate the, the article doesn't situate it within the book. What is interesting in the book is that it actually uh, starts with, as you read, but even before that, it starts with, um, let me see if I can get this here. Uh, In the book, it actually starts with the meaning of transparency in 1591 and it goes on. So it actually, in a funny way, not in a funny way, but in a very interesting way, in a very, very sort of articulate way, in a way, in a, um, he begins to give us the, um, the sort of the definition of transparency before he goes into um, coming up with the definition of literal and phenomenal. Mm -hmm. What I um, then I also read a piece, um, and this is how I read usually. I, I like to sort of go to the source and then uh, uh, cross it over with a later edition of it, which is sort of either photocopied or in the old days and now scanned and put into another publication, which is the Yale one, right after the one that appeared in his book. And then I read a piece by Hoseley, by Bernard Hoseley, uh, who um, is basically discussing uh, and shedding light onto his reading of um, Slutsky and, and, and Colin Rowe's text. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, it's the way that I read not only a book, but I also like to look at a word. I mean, the, 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 the origins of the word, the way that it has been uh, deformed becomes important. So that's why I thought that maybe this is the way that we should begin to, not should, but um, should with a lot of ifs, uh, begin to think of some of the sort of very important texts of the 50s and the 60s, which really became extremely important as reference systems in the 70s and 80s. I don't know when Gary was in school, probably after me. I'm probably the old sage of the whole table here. But, um, uh, but I think that I looked at when I had signed my book, and it was the first year that I arrived at the AA. So, uh, which is actually the second year, 1979. So um, in the 70s, the reading of this piece was a very different thing than today. And I asked myself, how could we think of literalness and, uh, or literal transparency and phenomenal transparency at a time where abstraction has almost disappeared? Now, I'm not saying that we can't abstract. Of course, we as architects all are still working with abstraction because the plan and the section are total abstractions of something. So they're not. So I began to think of it, and I'm going to stop here and then maybe we'll come back to it. I began to think of it, how could we resituate texts like this in the contemporary practices that we have of architecture, but also the contemporary practices of criticism and, uh, and theory. Mm -hmm. As Gary said very rightly, I don't think that there are that many, um, I mean, we don't have Banham's and, and, and uh, Jenks's today. We do have a series of historians and uh, younger sorts of um, uh, architects who are writing about history and theory, um, but not in a way to um, look at the reasons for and bring us to understand modernism. Mm. Because we are, I mean, uh, especially, I mean, it, we're still in the postmodernism and the postmodern era that we're in has been perfectly described and written by uh, Charles Jenks. So it's a very difficult moment that we're in and perhaps it is your generation which we have to look toward or forward to, to use architecture education as something that doesn't only 
turn you to become sort of practicing architects in the first sense of the word, but practicing thinkers that actually think about the moments that we are in architecture right now. Because if one looks at all of these people, they were not all of them, but most of them were architects. I mean, the, the other name that comes to me is Alan Cahoon. Alan Cahoon and his um, history of modern architecture is written from the point of view of an architect who has already practiced. So I think these are the um, these were things that came back to me and, and made me think of how can we resituate this text today and how could we allow this text, which was of a different time, to have a sort of a, I don't know, seventh, tenth, twelfth version of itself? Mm. I'll stop there and then maybe we can, we can discuss um, other issues. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a, re a really interesting point because I, I know, like, I was talking with Owen. He's probably not going <laughs> not going to speak on this, but I, I was talking with Owen before we jumped on the call, uh, and he he mentioned like, like it seemed almost like to us as as students, like it seemed kind of irrelevant. Like in it, it felt kind of irrelevant at least, or at least that the relevance of it wasn't um, at first glance very obvious, and perhaps. I might invite Gary to, to, to respond to Nazreen there because I think um, considering you, like you mentioned, you're, you're not forcing, but, but you're inviting your students to read this, this text. And I guess I, I wonder what your thoughts on it in a, in a contemporary context are. Yeah, well, I first read it, I suppose, in the 90s. I was in college in the 80s, but I first came across it and across it again. And my reading of it the second time was very different from the first. Uh, for reasons I can't quite explain. And it's something that I definitely keep coming back to, not because I think that it's, a, and not because I think the point about phenomenal space really is what he's talking about, I think, is in itself that critical, but because I think that type of critique, that sort of um, surgical, surgical analysis, of the nature of space has just gone out of the debate. And I like, uh, I find that in the sort of, in recent writings, you know, when you're asking students to read about work, it tends to have, um, it tends to come from, you know, sort of a, the, the political, you know, it's sort of their political reading, you know, the cultural analysis moved in a, in a kind of, a generally, I think, in a political direction. And I think it's interesting to ask my students to think about some way of analyzing space, uh, analyzing space, which is to do with the space in itself, the thing as it is. I find uh, Rose's ability to do that in this and in other essays, and I don't know where Mark has gone, but I have read that piece about the Laurentian Library, and I think it is amazing. I think it is absolutely critical. Uh, it was just a wonderful thing to come across because our, the Laurentian is just something that I find fascinating building. It's, it's like the Campidoglio and, sure. and maybe the Teatro Olimpico. I just think that there's something going on. And it's when you read Row, you suddenly realize, oh my God, this is something that goes. I don't think he's talking about literal transparency. I think he's talking about something else to do with the nature of space, but it's something that goes back to the Laurentian. And it is, he's putting his finger on something that is a truth about the nature of space. Sorry, uh, I'm going on a bit. You, you feel like you're going on too long. I think like, I'd, I'd like to hear you elaborate a little bit on, on what you think it is he's putting his finger on because you think he's putting his finger on something, but yeah. it's not particularly clear to me what he's putting his finger on. Okay, all right. Well, I think in the discussion, in the discussion of space, you know, uh, maybe there's always this sort of, it's kind of like, uh, it's one of these great dualities that we can always sort of, um, dichotomies that we can always point to when we're talking about cultural theory, that what is, what is space? Is it the material that encloses or is it some sort of ether that is between the walls and the columns? What is this thing? And I think in a lot of uh, cultural architectural criticism, the critics, the writers, especially recently, make no attempt to address this. Um, the space is the space is the space. Um, the architecture is as it is, and it's something to do maybe with a digital turn. Um, but the real sort of questioning of 
how do we get at this thing that we as architects seem to be so fascinated with? This thing which is either, which we, we, which we seem to believe is something that exists regardless, you know, which is somehow independently there. That's like the ma in Japanese architecture. It's there when you take the structure away, it's there. And I think this is one of the few, I, I think uh, Roe is one of the few writers who comes back to this. And that's why I find it mm -hmm. interesting. So he's trying, he's trying to sort of understand what space is in abstraction. Um, and I suppose that kind of comes back to Nazarene's point then about talking about abstraction. Nazarene, you said, you said you think in contempt in a contemporary context, like we don't, we don't really talk yeah. about abstraction anymore. Well, uh, I think that I think that we have a real problem of abstraction because we're losing abstraction because of the way that we are looking at reality. But let's let's leave that for a second, uh, and then maybe we can come back to it. Because I would like to I would like to um, second what Gary is saying in the way that I do think that if one begins to um, it's it's a very uh, easy way of saying that he immediately uh, brings to mind a, a, a sort of contemporary question which has been in architectural education for a long time and especially in the in the recent years and that is uh, doing versus thinking doing versus thinking making versus thinking uh, making something and therefore learning through making or learning through thinking. So I think these are probably the most contemporary ways that I could bring this, this text into to today's uh, issues that we're, we're not only trying to deal with, but we're also struggling with. So um, I totally understand and second and sort of 100% um, agree with very, very few texts that are writing about architecture today actually write from the point of view of architecture. And therefore, a lot of it is um, sort of um, social, uh, philosophical, political um, issues that sort of um, uh, hide the architectural capacity of these works. You know, so um, uh, there are some texts that do this perfectly well, and there are some historians and theoreticians, even you know younger ones. I'm not talking about 80 year old ones. I'm talking about you know sort of uh, uh, 40 end of 40 to 60 years old, uh, you know, critics and uh, historians. But I'm I I um, I was specifically saying that somebody like Cahoon was an architect who had practiced and therefore was writing architectural history based on understanding, very acute understanding of spatial and therefore architectural codes with which then he uh, situates things. So this is probably, and this is what Hosley is saying, that this is probably, um, and I'll read it. He says, firstly, uh, the significance of this essay is threefold. Firstly, it demonstrates both a sober as well as a precise and fact-related working technique that is seldom applied to architectural works of the 20th century. So that's the first thing that he says which is absolutely, extreme, absolutely important to know. Secondly, for more than half a century, architects and critics of architecture have seen the significance of architectural development in the fact that an avant-garde necessarily brings forth what is new in a continuous, uninterrupted succession. Okay, so he already is telling us that these two things are extremely important that um, that this text actually opens up. Now, he's writing this in 1968, whereas the text is, so what I am in favor of, and that's where I would say that it's important to reread these texts and contextualize them, not in terms of not formally, not physically, but situate them in the time that we are, is to begin to understand why were they important at the time that they were written and therefore begin to superimpose them with a certain number and uh, other other issues. And that's why the text is extremely important because we have literature, 
So we have the Joycean idea of the phenomenal and the, and the literal. Uh, we have the idea of uh, painting that comes into the way that it, and, and at the end of the time, it becomes material versus space. So material versus space is Gropius is material and um, uh, space is core. So all of a sudden we begin to see, and then one can go back and say, hey, wait a minute, this is very interesting because if one begins to look at the Bauhaus and look at the, the, look at the, uh, look at the German uh, um, Werkbund and the way that they were working with a series of um, uh, material possibilities in architecture of the time. So it's a text that is not dated, though, the way that one reads it, and that's what I have a problem with with Colin Rowe and the same thing with Collar City and everything, is that it is, there are so many words that are there that one could almost sort of, it's very difficult to take those words out because it also creates a preciseness in the text. But it's very difficult to read these texts because um, they, they, need, they have a, they have a uh, this specific text has a very, very sort of, an, explicit need for us to be able to look at every single thing that he's saying. And that's why the text of Hoseley, which I'm happy to afterwards send it to all of you guys, is extremely important because at the end, all he even, ex they even expand on the, on the figures and the um, pictures of Garch and um, the sort of uh, the, 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 the plans of the United Nations uh, competition, et cetera, et cetera. So League of Nations. So um, I think that, uh, again, I'm gonna stop here, but I think that it's extremely important to unpack these texts very, very carefully and very precisely, almost architecturally. You need to dissect them. You need to mm -hmm. dissect them and go into every detail that it has, because even though it's about 12 pages or something like that in the original book, it, this, this could be written as a pamphlet of about 45, 50 pages. And that's yeah. what Hosley and, you know, so anyway. Yeah, I think it's, it's actually kind of funny that you mentioned uh, Kalar City and the fact that, that Roe uses a lot of words because the, the, the one review of Kalar City on Google Books is, uh, quote, not a fun read, absolutely atrocious. Sentences ramble on for whole paragraphs. Use periods, people. Make your point succinct. Stop overusing commas. Make your point and move on. So I, th I think, like, I know, I know this is obviously a bit over the top, but I, I think it's something that I kind of felt when I was reading uh, this text as well. Uh, that that it it is, it's extremely dense. Like you said, like it could easily be expanded on, uh, you know, like fivefold. Um, and I, I think perhaps that is something that makes it hard to read as students like I know like bringing you back to, to what you mentioned at the start Nazreen that, that that there's something about architectural education to be to be questioned in this like mm. how, how do we make something like this relevant to architecture students nowadays because I don't know I guess to the point that that either you you or Gary were making as well that that a lot of reading in in this modern context gets goes down the, the political aspect of it or, or um you know, sort of diverges from the, the purely architectural sense of things. You guys both seem to think that, that this purely architectural reading of things is important. And I wonder, is, is there a disconnect between what students think and what, what you guys think or what you guys think is important? Uh, Steph, I think um, if I, maybe I could give something that might just illustrate it. I don't think it's really, um, I don't think, you know, it's not, say my position with regard to the text wouldn't be, um, diametrically say opposed to your I think it's a more subtler thing you know mm -hmm. but if I can give you maybe just a little illustration hopefully this will help uh, driving off the topic too much but say in first and second year third year perhaps or maybe even older years I don't know you know you'll suggest to a student that we're going to do a project we're going to do or whatever a library or whatever and the student goes to the site and essentially the site comes first and there is a site analysis and we see the views and we see the context and we see the scale and that's it seems to me lately in particular and maybe in the past 15 years 
that there's something inevitable then about what follows with the architecture. It becomes sort of the kitchen house extension, like so many kitchen house extensions we've seen to grade two listed buildings. That it's there's an inevitability about how the how the space is made and rolls out. And I I think that there's something that has to be discussed. Now that it's fine, you know, that's fine. There's all sorts mm -hmm. of architectures. But I like to engage with the students and say, um, perhaps before you before we resolve these forces to do with the site and the views and the and the change in level and the sun diagram. Is there something to be said about the nature of the space itself that you want to bring to the mix? Is there something inside you that says, "There's some I have the makings of an of a Laurentian library in me," and it's not something that necessarily is to do with the resolution of site forces? And I'm very interested in that because I think it's lost step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I th think bring, bringing it back to the to the text. Um, I think Roe Ro talks about like in, in the in the um, distinction he's making between literal transparency and and phenomenal transparency. I think like the the, the latter is more experiential. So like it, it's about this this spatial experience. And one of the points that I got hung up on is it felt like some of the arguments that he was making against not against. So he was he wasn't making them against. He was just trying to. To make the distinction between the two but it kind of at points it felt like he was describing the same thing just in two different ways in, in the sense that it was all coming back to this spatial experience no i mean no. can i just jump in maybe quickly step and um mm -hmm. but, i mean i suppose i i think the thing about experiential is always important in the it's funny because it's not at the forefront of a lot of what colin Rowe writes like except that there's a famous review of La Tourette that he did that is is really striking because it's led entirely from what it's like to experience the thing firsthand as a visitor or as opposed to say the mathematics of the ideal villa where it's 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 about thinking as and as Reen says how do we it's about the grammar and syntax of building and how it works but the important thing about the phenomenal transparency is he's saying this manipulation of space and form is what engenders certain feelings or certain experiences for the user you know in other words you like that's what i think the value of the piece is more for students might be to say there is a value in understanding how it is that you can manipulate this because it has real um <clears throat> impact beyond it itself it has real impact in terms of how this building will appear in its context and how it will manifest to itself to people you don't need to buy into the idea that that's that's an equivalent that creates a greater degree of transparency in society or whatever but just the th like his understanding is you know when you when you when you mess about with the engine like or whatever you know you tinker about with the, the actual language it it has real effect sorry mark yeah, I think there's, um, yeah, I totally agree. I think there's two types of spaces being referred to. And the word coulisse is important here. I have to look it up every time I see it. Um, I'll have to look it up again now before finishing the sentence probably, but it's a piece of flattened stage scenery in a play that's behind the stage or it's slid onto the stage. And he, he describes the League of Nations like this, like a series of these almost like planes that you pass through, but between these, representations of space, if you like, these flattened planes, there is actual space running in the other direction. And this seems to be, this seems to touch on a profound truth about when he uses phenomenal, I kind of think pictorial might be more useful, but maybe that's not enough either. Mm. He, it's all based on certain assumptions, like the idea that the Bauhaus is best understood obliquely you could easily do the same operation on the Dessau buildings that he does on the League of Nations, I'm sure. I mean, I don't know the site, but I'm sure you could treat it as a series of planes and spaces that open up in that way. Um, but it's important for his thesis to take all of that work out of this discussion about space, about planar space, and to have it all floating in some general space, whether it's a Kandinsky painting or a or Bauhaus work. 
I think it remains for that reason really relevant and interesting. I think I, I, would, I, go I, on, would, I don't know. I mean, I, it would be great for the students to come in because they've probably been reading this uh, text. But I was just thinking, as Mark was saying, that I was just thinking, OK, so if if um, if Colin Rowe is uh, not putting in opposition, but uh, comparing two things in order to critically bring out the idea of what he's trying to define, which is Gropius and a core. How would we talk about phenomenal and literal in the work of Corb and Lopes? Because, and I think that the, that's where I really think that these texts are not so much important in terms of the understanding of the text, but for us to be able to, um, to encourage you, but also almost tickle you into being able to read these texts within a larger sort of um, context of the literature that there is in, uh, in uh, at our hands. I mean, there, it's all, oh, it's everywhere. There is so much that one can uh, read, not only in order to write about it, but also to understand fully why is it that we are in this horrendous, problem where we are today with architecture and uh you know whether we like it or not there is nobody nobody that is going to convince me that we can actually still think of space in the same way that michelangelo did or or corb did not only because of the fact that you know they were geniuses but also because of the fact that our contemporary social political economical world doesn't any longer it's it changes the way that the brain works and therefore we uh, we need to, we need to be very agile as architects having that in mind having with this in mind and bringing them together and that's where the text is important to be read however uh it needs to be resituated yeah i think i think mark touched on something I, I think is kind of interesting this idea that there is a, a truth behind what Roe is writing like that there's something universal to it I feel like what he was saying as well sort of suggested something similar and I don't know because I, I just I, I wonder what that universality is because like you've just kind of said it, it's almost transient like I, th this how we think about architecture needs to change and like what you're saying is that we we need to read this text to understand how it was thought about but also then question how it should be thought about and i wonder if if that is in opposition to this idea of universality uh, uh mark <laughs> i i'm actually interested in something that you said there a second ago about could we apply the same same reading to the Bauhaus for the collection of buildings i'm not sure the Bauhaus, but i do think when you run this uh, program, the, the Colin Row sort of program of, of analysis, when you run the Barcelona Pavilion through it, mm. then you come up with something really interesting. Mm. I just mm. think it's fascinating. It's just, it's sort of like, oh, I see the next essay now, you know, the one that he, I mean, I know there is a part two to this, but uh, that there's another, there's yet another reading here, you know, there's another level to take it, what happens when your trans, your literal and your phenomenal aren't so easily separated, you know, maybe you end up with something that's perhaps quite fabulous. And I definitely think that there is something in this line of inquiry, this line of thinking that we as architects, architecture students, we just, we really need to re-engage in because that's where the richness is. That's where you know, this, the meat of what it is that we do. That's where it lies, it's in there. It's the, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's, I think those points are interesting. I also think uh, on Nazreen's point, I, I think I'm not 100% sure that he's actually talking about transparency. And maybe this is where a difficulty lies for people approaching the text for the first time. Is he actually talking about something? Is he just using the wrong words? It's not really transparency. In my in my mind, uh, it's a, it's another phenomenon, and it's and maybe two, but uh, and they and they do they do uh, 
they do suffer the comparison but and stand to it, but they're not transparency. I, just, I was going to throw a bigger one in, in sorry, not the bigger one, I just interested I mean, um, I'm not sure, Nazreen, and I'm not really um, following things, possibly, I don't think there's such a problem with architecture in the world. I think there's a problem with, let's say, housing provision, there's a problem, problem with, a general problem with commodification of the product. And um, it seems like we're almost returning to a pre, to a period like in a collapse of social democracy in Weimar maybe, or we're, we're returning to, it seems like there are cycles. There are new forms of communication, new forms of representation perhaps, and there are of course, but I wonder how, I mean the big attempt of Vidkar and, and Roe was to try and universalize in history, to, to kind of go backwards into history. I think Terry Eagleton says somewhere to back into history in order to go forward to find universals. And it may be that these, this fundamental difference between real space and imaginary space is a universal. And whether this is this problem today is, seems to me to be problems, social problems to do with just inequality, which I'm not sure how they affect, I, I, I can't say more, I'm, I'm not sure how this produces a crisis of architecture per se, or architectural language. Well, it's, it, I mean, uh, architectural language, no, maybe, but I mean, archi uh, architecture and by, uh, by, by sort of um, effect and consequence, consequently, therefore, architectural language. But I think that, I do think that that, that does create a problem for architecture because um, uh, we have, we, I mean, architecture re, uh, responds to and responds to a, a, to a society. And this society is exactly what you're describing. And I totally agree with you. I mean, yes, there is a problem of, and therefore architecture cannot abstract itself from the situation that we're in. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, look, the, the, just, just to illustrate this, isn't it the most sort of um, ridiculously um, abominable thing to hear that, social uh, media and Facebook and this and that and uh, Instagram and all of this has created the possibility of uh, more democracy, social democracy. However, since when, in what part of our history has democracy been controlled by five people in the world? So, I mean, this is exactly the problem that I think that architecture is faced with, is that uh, now, I'm not saying uh, architecture is doomed. I'm just saying that we are, we are in a moment whereby it is almost more important to read these texts, create a foundation, understand why it is and how it is that architecture can come back into being a necessity that the society has to have at whatever levels, as opposed to say, let's go out there and build one. You know, so I, I mean, I'm killing myself to hold myself back as an architect who wants to design something good for the good of a larger uh, sort of portion of the public. However, I don't think that the, 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 the sort of the, that phenomenal five people that are controlling the whole world could actually give that possibility. And that's why, I mean, which competition can you think of in the past five years? I'm not going to say 15 years because there were maybe in 15 years ago or 20 years ago, but in the last five or six years, that have had the openness of the League of Nations. I guess I wonder how, how does this come back to so so there's there's two different lines here. Like Mark arguing that the crisis is not with architecture, instead it is like a, a, a socio-political thing, something that exists outside of architecture. And 
Nazreen, you're saying that it's something that that is within architecture. And I wonder, like, how, how does this come back to what you're saying about we can't design thing like if we, if we were to design something like Le Corbusier did, it wouldn't necessarily be relevant today. And I wonder how, how does that connect into things? It's not that it wouldn't be relevant. Is that is that we it's, can't or? I, I, it's, uh, sorry, was that Mark or was that? No, no, you, I, I was cutting you across, but do you go on? I, I just think, I just, no, no, go I, ahead, go ahead, go I, ahead. This I, is, I, nobody else is talking, it's only five of us. So. <laughs> if I could just say, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Nazarene. I mean, you're, these problems outside of architecture are always the problems of architecture. Architecture is always political and in fact, the context of this essay that debates in England between Bannon and one and Pevener or Pevsner on the one hand, supporting the, the Bell House and, and Rowe and, and Wittler on the other hand, looking at these, these more art historical themes um, remain as the principal concern, which has got to do with to what extent does architecture include the design of production, which is what the Bauhaus was. Or to what extent is architecture like true green design through involvement in imagining other forms of housing uh, provision and so forth. And um, that this remains the dialectic actually that was between, that was represented in the, the struggles between these, these very intense debates, which achieved at this period in England, an incredible level of sophistication as, as evidenced by this essay that we, wrote, that we read. Um, but the, the stakes remain, I guess, and that I think it's got to do with to what extent does architecture, where does architecture get its sources? To what extent is architecture's principal source, uh, universal, mathematical, so on, abstract? And there's a, uh, there's a quotation fr from Wren in the book that I was reading this morning, uh, which contrasts uh, natural and customary geometry. And this goes right back to Alberti. Somehow or other that architecture, right back to Brunelleschi. This is Tafuri's idea that Brunelleschi introduced this universal mathematical harmonic so and so, so, so uh, and so on, as against extraneous, um, local, customary, empirical data. And that I think is what this debate is about letting in the letting in the world into architecture hmm. so i wonder how that comes back then to what we were saying about uh, saying at the start about there being a purely architectural mode to look at things hmm. well that was the warburgians were trying to do in a way the Wittkowians, this is my this is the uh, Wittler essay on it uh, we're trying to have I feel like a purely uh, architectural an abstraction of geometry as the foundation, whether it was it was Palladian or Mannerist or analytical cubism, that everything can be returned to some kind of geometrical uh, certainties. But it also it might, it might be possible to read it if you you know strict of that larger project, say ideal a sort of an an idealistic project i think you could still read it in a kind of a almost a technical way as a, a way yeah. of thinking about I'm, I'm thinking of say somebody could you know if you think about adam curtis right and his magnum opus's kind of documentaries which are spliced together found footage from the bbc archive to which he has unique access you could he knows about editing you could write a piece about adam curtis's edit which would just be instructive in and of itself, irrespective of the subject matter. And you could even describe how he uses edit to create certain effects, like 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 the way Eisenstein wrote about edit. And and still, you don't need to go beyond that to sort of say, um, that's because editing is all there is, or let us believe, therefore, that edit the editor is actually the the mm -hmm. you know the person who dictates film and language or whatever. I think that's what the mm -hmm. spirit in which I think Roe, like that essay and others like them, are really, really interesting still because it's a close attention. It's a close reading, isn't it? It's a close attention to the mechanisms. And and you're aware of the limitations. You're aware of the bracketing out of all the political complexities. I mean, although it's not accidental that he would choose the League of Nations. But but nonetheless, He's he's still it's very precise as Nazarene says it's kind of got this language that's endlessly trying to 
parse and <laughs> um, what would you say approximate the, the 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 impacts that he's trying to describe or the operations he's trying to describe. And Adam Kurtz is a good reference because a lot has to do with putting things beside each other, like in towards a new architecture, the way Core puts you know puts things on either side of the page, which is exactly what apparently Mathematics of the Ideal Villa was originally published in that format yeah. um, in the in the AR. Um, that yeah. kind of language, that kind of argument made by showing comparisons of configurations. Uh, that's what Curtis does. He's constantly trying to make comparisons through visual homology. It's also, as you say it there, it's also interesting that it was published in the AR, like a lot of his work. Like it was published in a journal for the profession mm. in a way that it'd be hard to imagine now that, that a, you know, that a piece like that would find an audience um, like that in a monthly magazine that was also mm. a new project. And, um, Although which is which, which I think Hughes is, is the pity. I think that's that's the that's the issue. I think that for me it, to take up an Azreen's point, I think that's the that's the problem with architecture at the minute, if there is one, is that there is no space for this type of debate, which um, we're tolerating. Um, and I don't think there's an excuse, you know, for the exclusion of this type of debate. I'm not, sure, I'm not so sure that's true, though, Gary. Like, if you think about the architectural review right now, mm. they, they right now in its current editorship, like here, I mean, they, they, don't, yeah. they don't feature buildings on the cover. They, they take themes. They, mm. they do include quite a number of essays, quite a, lot, quite a lot of, you would say, theory or at least... Um, attempts to make sense of architecture under certain frames it's quite so there is i think there is appetite i don't think it's exactly the equivalent of of a colin rowe essay uh and there's lots of other reasons for that like the requirements of academic publishing etc cetera, etc cetera. but i do think there's quite a lot of um critical writing and Steph is going to found oh, no, that is... Steph is going to found an architectural journal now. Yeah, great. Today, <laughs> and we're going to be the founding. This is going to be the founding at the <laughs> meeting. <laughs> it's Hugh, Hugh, you're absolutely right, of course. Yeah, there is a lot of critical writing. But it's so seldom you come across something that's going to provoke you. I mean, I can't remember what was in the last day. Yeah, that's maybe yeah, well. So you know, that, what do you that, what do you think is missing then? I, I'm I'm not sure I, I quite follow. Like there's a, a debate that's missing. What what is this debate that needs to be had? And there's a keenness of analysis, a keenness of intellect, and a brilliance that's missing these days, uh, because it's not politically popular. I think I, that not, feels um, really general. Though. Like that's just something that. For, that feels really general though. Like that feels like something you could say about anything. Like in a purely architectural sense, how, how does that, like like in terms of the profession, I guess, because, hmm. These people thought at the, this debate, sorry, these people at the time, this was existential. This was like life or death. They really believed that this was, this was architecture in the center of the world. And hmm. that's what's happened. We, we've accepted our postmodern condition of, um, you know, at the edges. Uh, as just another supplier of of the of, of commodified culture, maybe. I, th I think, yeah. Mark, though, if I can just uh, interrupt, um, it, it, it's a discussion of architecture in, in purely formal terms, and and this sort of uh, problem with that that um, it seems that this this whole the, the whole article is uh, an analysis of of art and architecture where perspective is key to understanding the the work whether it's um whether it's architecture or painting and like if you if you look at how he analyzes garsh you can either understand it from a certain fixed position in the back garden or in the in the plan mm. and and when you get when he gets to the uh the league of nations i i really couldn't follow him there how how, how that was supposed to work and it seemed to me like the, that he, he like he mentions um, a kind of sophisticated man mm. um, who, who can kind of discern the meaning oozing out of the out of the walls. 
And I, I think that that sort of aspect is quite dated um, because what's that got to do with, with the decision-making that needs to happen in the League of Nations to maintain world peace or, you know, whatever. Um, that's just, that, that could be anything. So, um, but on the other hand, it is trying to engage with, um, with the sort of depth, or, you know, the depth of perception. And he begins with that, with, with the Joyce and kind of um, epiphany um so I, I think there's just a little bit of a disconnect there um be, between that kind of perception and then the, this perspectival kind of uh you know this where, where where things only make sense from a fixed point of view 